Many of you have seen our booklet, The World to Come, what it will be like, probably have electronic copy, if not um, the printed one. There was something written here on page 14 that I'll bet people uh, read over, maybe took a little note of it, but didn't give it a, a great deal of thought. I'd like to read it to you. This is on page 14. And it's talking about here uh, uh, prophecy, especially the book of Revelation, what's on ahead. And speaking of John, the apostle that uh, recorded the book of Revelation, John describes this future event, uh, meaning Christ's return in Revelation 20, verses 1 through 3. And it quotes it, When I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, the devil, and Satan, bound him for a thousand years, and he cast him into a bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. This confinement will render Satan completely powerless to influence anyone for a thousand years. This reference to Satan's 1,000-year banishment is significant because it's the first time in the Bible the first time the Bible defines a time frame for, of Christ's initial rule after his return. The Old Testament contains hundreds of prophecies about this time, but not until this verse. At the very end of the Bible are we given the length of time that Christ will rule over the human inhabitants of the earth who survive the climactic end time. This period, the 1,000-year reign of Christ, is often called the millennium, from the Latin word mille, uh, meaning a thousand. So we probably read over, read over that and maybe didn't give it a great uh, deal of thought one way or the other. But as was mentioned, it's the very first time anybody ever heard about this uh, length of time of being what is where we get the term millennium, this 1,000 years. In other words, the, all the Old Testament restoration, which we would call the millennial prophecies, and we'll probably hear a lot of them uh, in the feast, uh, about what's coming and what's predicted and so on. None of them ever mention anything about a 1,000 year period of time. And there's nothing really in the New Testament. Jesus didn't say you'll see the Son of Man coming in the clouds and he'll be here for a thousand years. Or Paul say we're going to rise together and meet the Lord and be with him for a thousand years. It's just never mentioned anywhere until the book of Revelation chapter 20. So the 12 apostles, if you think about it, the 12 original apostles, uh, minus John, we could say, and the entire early New Testament church didn't know about this millennial concept. Now, they would have known about Christ returning. They would have known about him, him talking about a kingdom. That's certainly true. But they wouldn't have known anything about this 1,000-year period of time. So when they observed the Feast of Tabernacles, they wouldn't say, well, we're picturing the 1,000-year millennium. They wouldn't have known anything about that aspect of it. When it came to the last great day, they wouldn't say, well, this is picturing the great white throne judgment. They had never heard of a great white throne judgment. That came in Revelation chapter 20, which wasn't written until 90, maybe 100 AD. So they didn't know anything about that. Now, I don't mention this uh, in a, in, for the purpose of minimizing what's in Revelation. What's there is very important. But it shows that the people of God have had varying degrees of understanding over time. They didn't always know everything. Sometimes God would reveal things, obviously, as time moved on. There were 3,000 baptized on the day of Pentecost, a few days later another 5,000, and none of them had ever read any, any books of the New Testament. None of them had ever been written yet. So they didn't know anything that's in the New Testament. All that we read, the Re Re resurrection chapter, the faith chapter, the Holy Spirit chapter, they didn't have any of that. Now, once God shows something, we obviously have to adhere to it. 
Look at Luke chapter 12, verse 48. Luke 12, 48. Because they didn't know something or weren't aware of it, and that's the whole reason for writing the epistles and the letters of the New Testament. It was to clarify things for people, answer questions. It wouldn't mean that we could dismiss it. In Luke chapter 12, 48, but he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes will be beaten with few stripes because you just didn't know. For unto whosoever much is given, of him shall much be required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. Well, we, have, we have the printed word of God, so obviously God would tend to expect more of us. Look what we have available. Look at all the New Testament books that we have that they didn't have. So there would be more in, let's say, a judgment, more expected of us from that standpoint than somebody else but didn't have that available. So you can't pretend you've never seen the New Testament or the book of Revelation. In Titus chapter 2 and verse 7, Titus chapter 2 and verse 7, And in all things showing yourself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, and sincerity, so even though they didn't have a lot of understanding because things hadn't been written yet, at least the early church, the original, let's say, 11 apostles, John writing Revelation, doctrine is important. In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrine, commandments and ideas and concepts of men. Can't do that. So I thought I wanted this fact about the variation in what people understood, the knowledge that was available to them at different times, would be an introduction to the sermon. The sermon is, what is the common denominator for all Christians and all people of God? What's the common denominator? Now, these early Christians were every bit as much a Christian as you and I are. No different. Every bit, 100% Christian, before the New Testament was written, before Revelation, the things they didn't know when they were baptized, the 3,000, the 5,000, the, the churches that Paul served. Every bit as much a Christian as we are. You know, we're human beings living in an amazing age of knowledge and understanding and technology, uh, and compared to, let's say, people who lived in 2000 BC, it's astronomical. And what's at our fingertips uh, on the internet? But they're no less human beings than, than we are. They're 100, they were 100% human, we're 100% human. So knowledge doesn't make you a human, and knowledge by itself doesn't make you a Christian. Doesn't turn you into one. All humans share some fundamental qualities of what a human is. And that's true with all Christians, whenever they live, the people of God. So what is the foundational trait all Christians share? What is it? What do we all have? It wouldn't be the same level of understanding. That's varied down through time. You had saints in the Old Testament. They didn't understand things that we do now. It wouldn't be a level, a certain level of righteousness because that is varied. You look at Revelation chapter 2 and 3 and Jesus or John is writing to the different churches and they all have various issues, shortcomings. It's not a number of good works. It's not baptism because everybody in the Old Testament, there, there will be individuals, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, many others resurrected. They'd never been baptized. 
So it's not that. So what is it? What is it that everybody shares? Same for everybody. Now you could say the Holy Spirit, and that would be very valid. We could say God's Holy Spirit, and that probably fit into what I'm mentioning. But I'm going to list three others. Three other traits of Christians or God's people, the ones God is, was working with spiritually. Three traits. The first one, all God's people have been given a calling. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because that was Mr. Kylo's sermon, basically, a few weeks ago. He talked exclusively about that and more in depth. But he did talk about the calling. Look at the scripture in Psalm 65, verse 4. This is an interesting one. Psalm 65, verse 4. All of the people that God works with or that will be resurrected can share and say, well, they had been given a calling from God. Psalm 65, 4, blessed is the man whom you choose and cause to approach unto you, that he may dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, even of your holy temple. God reaches out to call someone, to invite the individual to his courts. Blessed is the individual that God has called to enter into your courts. In other words, you can't just walk in on your own. God has to allow you, call you, draw you, however you want to put it. He does so by enlightening your mind, changing your heart. He reaches out in some way to help you so that then you'd want to take the steps. That's true. But there's a calling. There's a choice God makes. Blessed are those you choose to approach unto you. Isaiah 65, verse 1. Here's God speaking in Isaiah 65, verse 1. I made myself available to those who did not ask for me. They weren't asking for him. <laughs> but I made myself available, revealed myself to a degree, reached out. I made myself available to those that did not ask for me. I appeared to those who did not look for me. I said, here I am, here I am. To a nation that did not invoke my name. Blessed are the individuals whom God chooses. Who God says, here I am. So God must reveal himself. You can't even just read the Bible. And become called. Or you can't just be religious. And have that same calling. Of course, we're very familiar with me. Well-known verse, John 6, nobody can come to me unless the Father draw him. Jesus made that statement. And in Revelation 17, 14, Revelation 17, 14, <clears throat> these shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords, King of kings, and they that are with him are called... So these individuals have been called. They're chosen, meaning they responded to that calling and became a part of the chosen ones and faithful. Called, chosen, and faithful. So all Christians anywhere can say, I've been called out of the world. I've been called by God out of the world of the world in which I was a captive, going along with everyone else. I received a calling. So that's why Paul said, for you see your calling. We're supposed to see that. 
2 Timothy 1.9, I'll read to you, who saved us and called us with a holy calling. A holy calling. So everybody that's resurrected when Christ returns, whatever age they were in, whatever their understanding might have been, they're all going to acknowledge I was called by God for whatever reason. Certainly wasn't any goodness or talents or anything God needed from me, but I was called by God. Thanks be to him. And, of course, we know there's an order to that calling uh, as well. Everybody is intended uh, for that calling. Point number two of the three, what are the character, what are the traits that all people of God would share? Not just a level of understanding. Couldn't be that. That's varied. Point number two is faith. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. Ephesians 2 and verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that's not of yourself, it's a gift of God. Everyone will share a fundamental faith. Faith in what? kind of faith. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11. It says in verse 6, without faith it's impossible to please God. For he that comes to God has to believe that God is. Obviously start there. You have to believe that, that God exists that he's aware of what's happening, he sees us. He's the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Must believe there's a God, he's aware of what we do, and it matters to him. We have to start there. Well, that faith is obviously in the God of the Bible. Everybody that's resurrected, everybody that's considered themselves Someone of God is going to be somebody that is, has a faith in the Bible, the Word of God. Verse 3 of Hebrews chapter 11. Through faith, we understand the faith in order to be saved. Through faith, we understand the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things are seen were not made of things which do appear. We're talking about the God of Genesis, the creator. That's the foundation of the faith. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, Cain and Abel. In other words, we're talking about the Bible, Bible stories. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jake, Jacob, that's the faith that we have. The word of God, we call it. Of course, many scoff at that, more so now than ever, <coughs> ever in the past. <clears throat> and they might even consider themselves Christians and believing in Jesus as the Savior. Well, Jesus talked about Adam and Eve. You say, haven't you, haven't you heard that he that made them in the beginning, male and female? Well, that's Genesis 1. What Jesus believed, that was the foundation of his faith. Scriptures can't be broken, he said. Talked about Noah and the flood. Talked about Abraham. All the Bible stories. So Jesus believed. The word of God. That's the faith. That's the foundation. Now everybody didn't have all the Bible. All through history. But it was the God of the Bible. The creator God. The God later of Israel. That's who they believed in. That's where their faith was based. And the, on the books that, that came later. So the Bible defines a way of life. A standard of behavior. That's our faith. 2 Timothy chapter uh, 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4.
The Apostle Paul, well-known verse, read often, I've fought a good fight. 2 Timothy 4, 7, I've fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. The faith in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the Bible. The God, as it said in Hebrews, the, who formed things out of nothing. That's the faith. So everybody resurrected when Christ returned will, will say, I, I, God called me. God made it possible for me to be here, to be a saint, be resurrected. And we all agree, whoever they are from whatever age, well, it's the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Creator God. Everybody share that. A lot of different variations in understanding and righteousness and many other things, I'm sure. Everybody will share that. All a brotherhood in that. And now the third point that I have and what the traits we share, maybe spend a little bit more time on this one. And I'll have an Old Testament example and a New Testament example. So let's go back to Genesis chapter 12. All the way back to Genesis that many again would discount as being irrelevant. So here's the God of the Bible, creator God. The Lord said unto Abram, here's what I want you to do. Get you out of your country, from your kindred, from your father's house, into a land that I'll show you. If you do that, I'll make you a great nation. I'll bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I'll bless them that bless you and curse him that curses you, and you shall all families of the earth be blessed. And <clears throat> naturally, any human being say, well, why would I want, where am I going? What am I going to do? What is, what's there? What do you have in store for me? I've got my family here. I've got my, my business and my income and my whole life. Why are you asking me to, what do you, what's, what do you have in store? Doesn't tell me. Is it just leave? What I want you to do. Well, most people would need a little more information here. Fill me in a little bit on all of this. <clears throat> so Abraham is called the father of the faithful because he decided he would submit to what God would have him to do. You might say he's the goat, the greatest of all time, other than Jesus, the father of the faithful because he just decided he would do what God asked him to do, not conditioned on knowing ahead of time. Says, I want you to leave and go, to, go there. Okay. You're God. I have no idea what you have in mind or what this means. That's what I'll do. So that is what you might say converted him from who he was before. He became converted at that point. Romans chapter 4 and verse 3, I can read this to you. For what says the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Okay, you're God. You're the creator. Now how he knew that and how he connected that, and, and we don't know. But he came, I guess like Rahab, you could say the same thing, convicted this was the God, the real God, the creator, the God of Israel. Your God, you're asking me to do this, I'll do it. No idea what it means. And it says when he made that choice, it was accounted unto him for righteousness that made him a righteous individual. It wasn't a level of his understanding at that point. A lot of things he didn't understand that we do now. 
So it wasn't some level of understanding of God's overall plan and holy days that hadn't been given yet and how the holy days unfold the plan and didn't have any of that. But he said, I'll do what you ask of me. And he was righteous. Of course, then he went on to demonstrate the kind of faith he had. Genesis 26, verse 5. Genesis 26, verse 5. What was a part of Abraham's righteousness was not only what he determined he would do, which was accounted for righteousness, but it says, because Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So it wasn't just lip service or good intentions. He went on to prove, I know you are God. You are the creator. You're the God of the, what would become the Bible. So he followed what he said as he learned it even willing to offer his son. And not knowing what that would, ha- what would actually happen, but it said in Romans he knew God could resurrect him if he wanted. It's amazing why he's the father of the faithful. Now let's look at a parallel example in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 9. We're all familiar with the Apostle Paul, very zealous, as he would say, in the Jews' religion, persecuting the church and convicted deeply that he was doing God's will in upholding the old covenant Jewish religion. He was a Pharisee. So we come to Acts chapter 9. Verse 3 says, The Apostle Paul uh, journeyed on his way to Damascus. Suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And this might say another calling. If God didn't call Paul, he would have gone on to Damascus and lived out his life and did whatever he thought was right. But here's God calling him through Christ, <clears throat> saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Huh? What? Who's that? He said, who, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, you know, I'm Jesus, the one you're persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the pricks. This isn't working out very well. Can you imagine how startled? He hated Jesus. The whole idea about Jesus being their Messiah. Uh, Paul, I'm Jesus. The one you've persecuted. And he was trembling and astonished. Well, these words don't describe what that experience would have been. And he trembling and astonished, Lord, what will you have me to do? Same as Abraham. What do you want me to do? I'll do it. That was his frame of mind from that point on. Paul was ready to listen. What do you want me to do? I'll do it. Can't believe it, you. Startled, astonished. What do you want me to do? He was ready to listen. No longer the prideful Pharisee that he thought he was. No longer on the mission for God that he thought he was on. All of a sudden, God, you could say, like the psalm, called him to his courts, opened his mind. Guess what, Paul? Wake up. And so when Paul experienced that, what do, you, what do you want me to do? I'll do it. I don't know what that means. I don't know what, this, what you have in mind, but what do you want me to do? 
I'll do it. And of course, Paul went on to demonstrate how deeply that commitment was. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10. He says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10, By the grace of God, I am what I am. What can I say? I did what I did, and I've become what I've become. That's all I can say. And his grace which is bestowed upon me was not in vain. I labored more abundantly than they all. That's how impactful that experience was. What do you want me to do? I labored more than all of them. And really it wasn't me, but it was God and the grace of God with me. The road to Damascus was the turning point. He had his orders. He would follow them. I want to illustrate this this concept, this third point, and relate a scene from the movie Gettysburg. Gettysburg is about, of course, obviously the uh, the Battle of Gettysburg and the Civil War. One of the best movies, um, one of my favorites, and certainly about the Civil War that's that's been made. And in that particular movie on that scene in in July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd is the setting. And on day number one, the Confederate Army, of course, they had moved into Pennsylvania. Uh, General Lee had decided, had argued in favor of moving up, and he didn't want him to go up into the north, and he, he argued for it. We've got to make some kind of a move. The north has the strength, the arms, we're not gonna last. We've got to make a decisive move and talked him into letting him take the Army of Virginia on into the north, into Pennsylvania. So their Confederate Army is moving through Pennsylvania, and they're coming towards the little town of Gettysburg. And General Buford's cavalry, uh, cavalry has the first encounter with the Confederate Army just to the east of the town of Gettysburg. So they get into a little bit of a skirmish, and they want to try to stop General Lee and the Confederates from moving into Gettysburg, taking over the shoe factory, because a lot of the Confederate soldiers didn't have shoes, and there was a good, a big shoe factory, and the town, and then the high ground outside of the city of Gettysburg, they tried, wanted to try to stop them from doing that. So here's the dialogue in the movie. This is the colonel that's the assistant or directly under General Buford. So the colonel says, after this skirmish on the outskirts, this initial skirmish on the outskirts of Gettysburg, the colonel says, we took some prisoners. They are from Heath's division of Hill's Corps. That's what I got in front of me. It's a new division, maybe 8,000 men more or less. All within the sound of this, just back up that road between here and Cashtown, just a little ways up the road. So General Buford says, well, it'll take them a while to get online. For all these soldiers to move in, it's going to take them a while. And so the colonel said, well, yes, sir, but Hill's Corps, Hill's whole corps is behind maybe 25,000 soldiers. Longstreet is behind that, and Ewell is just over there to the north. General Buford says, I know, Colonel, I know. And the Colonel says, the thing is this, sir. When John Reynolds gets here, uh, he's from the Union Army. The thing is, sir, when John Reynolds gets here, he won't have the whole army, only part of it. The point is, as I see it, The rebels will be here this afternoon with everything they've got. I just thought I would mention it, kind of with grave concern. I just thought I'd mention here now that by this afternoon, they're all going to be here, and here we are, stuck, very outnumbered. And then he says, now, what do you want me to do here, sir? That was his response. Listen, 
this doesn't look so good right now. But his response was, what do you want me to do here? What's your order? He was ready to follow orders and ready to do what was asked of him. Kind of amazing. I thought we would, uh, you would enjoy seeing that clip from the movie. So Aaron was kind enough to uh, arrange for that. So in about a minute or so. So here's the dialogue that I just read to you. And you'll see it from uh, the movie if you can cue that up and play that. We got them right out in the open. Really got a twist on them. They're arrogant people, you know? They came right at us. Listen, we took some prisoners. They're from Keith's division of Hills Corps. That's what I got in front of me. It's a new division. I figured 8,000 men, more or less. All within sound of this. Just back up that road between here and Cashtown. Just a little ways up the road. Yeah, it'll take them a while to get online. Yes, sir, but Hill's whole corps is behind. Maybe 25,000. Long Street behind that. Jewel over there to the north. I know, Colonel. I know. The thing is this, sir. When John Reynolds gets here, he won't have the whole army with him, only part of it. And the point is, as I see it, they're able to be here this afternoon with everything they've got. I just thought I'd mention it. Now, what do you want me to do here, sir? Well, Heath will be back in a bit. If he's got any brains at all, and he's not... I thought that, I thought that was an interesting part with, okay. What do you want me to do here? That's what soldiers are trained to do. What are my orders? What would you have me to do? They, they don't say, well, this is as far as I'm prepared to go here. I, mean, I didn't expect this. What do you want me to do? I've laid out for you what we're facing. What do you want me to do? Ready to give his life. That's what soldiers are trained to do. What would you have me to do? Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. We've heard this mentioned before that we are Christian soldiers. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. There, you therefore, son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard of me among many witnesses, and the same commit you to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. You therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Christ. The same comparison, saying to God, what would you have me to do here? What is your will? What is your way? So the soldier wasn't weighing, and they were, wait a minute, I don't think uh, with all these men we can do... Uh, <coughs> We can stay here any longer, or I'm leaving, or what, would, what do you want me to do? And that's what we say to God. Let's go to Matthew chapter 26, verse 38. We find that Jesus said the very same thing. Very familiar with this, Matthew 26, verse 28. 38, I'm sorry, Matthew 26, 38. Jesus said in Matthew 26, 38, my soul's exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. Wait here, watch with me, give me some support. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, O oh, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. What would you have me to do? Same attitude. All Christians have these same three characteristics. Everybody resurrected, they have different levels of understanding and righteousness and many other things, but these three traits, and others as well, I'm not saying they're the only three, but all Christians will have these three traits. Everyone will know God had a hand in my being here. God chose me. God called me. God summoned me and made it possible. Everybody will share that. All different circumstances. 
but they'll give God the credit. They won't say they came there on their own. They'll have faith in the same God, very same God, the creator God, the God of the Bible, the, God, the creator, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, father of Jesus Christ, and so on. Everyone will have the same attitude, and that will have been, what would God have me to do? My life is not my own. Follow God, we follow God's will. What would you have me to do? They've already made that choice, already made that decision in their life. My life belongs to God. They'll all share that. Same trait. Let's go to a final scripture and read this in Matthew 6, beginning in verse 9. So here's the prayer that Jesus said we're to pray. After this manner, here's, here's the kind of prayer you're supposed to have. Matthew 6 and verse 9. Our Father which art in heaven. That's the God of the Bible. The God in heaven. The creator God. The one true God. Holy is your name. It's your kingdom we're hoping is coming to take over <clears throat> the kingdoms of this world. Your will be done. What would you have me to do? Your will be done in earth just as it is in heaven. All the angelic, the faithful angelic beings, God, what would you have me to do? So give us this day our daily bread. We need help. We need help to walk in this way of faith. We need help to keep the faith, to keep these traits that we have, to see our calling. Give us that daily help. Forgive us when we fall short, because it's a lot to live up to. And help us to be forgiving of others. Lead us not into circumstances that are going to sidetrack us, derail us. Please deliver us from any evil. For though yours is the only kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Same idea. All Christians, all of God's people sharing in those same sentiments. Same God, same calling, same faith, same attitude at the core. What would you have me to do? Be your God. I'm not. Those three traits. Christian understanding, as we saw in the booklet, has varied down through history. God's revealed different things along the way. But the attitude has been the same. Same at the core. We go to the feast every year. We meet up with people from all over the world. A lot of different nationalities and personalities and circumstances. Everyone will share these same three traits, as well as some others, obviously. But they'll all share the same three traits. We're there at the feast to be reminded of our calling, increase our faith in the God of the Bible, and learn to fear God, which means we continue to say, what would you have me to do? You're God. I do what you would have me to do. So the Feast of Tabernacles, and as well as every Sabbath day, is for the purpose of helping us understand that we're called, chosen, and faithful.